Okay, we know that trade has been a very important element of life in ancient Mesopotamia for a very long period. Uh, trade and organization of the trade changed over time, and we're going to see different kinds of trading developments uh, with the old Assyrian trading system. Uh, but we have evidence from very early days in Mesopotamia through the early dynastic, and then as we talked about into the Akkadian period, uh, and then into these later periods that southern Mesopotamia was able to acquire the goods that they needed from other parts of the Middle East and South Asia. Uh, so they were getting things like copper from Oman and other areas of the Persian Gulf. Uh, they were getting gold maybe from Anatolia and also from Iran. And there were also direct trading links with the Indus Valley Civilization. And the Indus Valley Civilization was the largest ancient civilization uh, in the world in terms of geographic region. It covered an area right with one really uh not it's you know not quite homogenous but very very uniform uh culture right this was a flourishing civilization with large cities that uh existed at the same time as Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt and we have direct links. This is one of the famous Indus cities called Mohenjo-daro. This is looking at an important public building, and this is a public ritual bath uh, in Mohenjo-daro. One of the important elements of Indus civilization was craft production, as well as trade. Uh, the Indus Valley was in a river plain as well, and had great agricultural land, just like Mesopotamia, but did not have a lot of the stone and metals that it needed as well. And so it had to trade for those things. Now, what's some of the evidence that Mesopotamia and the Indus were trading? Well, we have Indus seals in Mesopotamia. We have Akkadian texts talking about ships from... Uh, its name back then was Meluha, right? That was either the Mesopotamian name for the Indus or the, the Indus people's name for their own civilization, Meluha. So we have records of uh, ships from Meluha in Mesopotamia as well as goods. Mesopotamians traded for gold, copper, and jewelry. And there is Indus jewelry in Mesopotamia, including in the royal tombs of Ur and Indus pottery found in Oman. So let's look at some of the pieces of evidence, right? Okay, we mentioned this before. These are water buffalo. They're not native to Mesopotamia. They were domesticated in the Indus and then brought over to Mesopotamia, and they're depicted here in the Cadian cylinder seal. Um, this is a, a stamp seal from the Persian Gulf that has an elephant on it, an elephant with small ears, it's an, it's an Indian elephant, not an African elephant. Um, these cylinder seals were made, uh, and you could see quite early, later Rook, Jemdet Nasser, uh, were made with a kind of shell that we see from the Indus Valley. So perhaps these are Indus Valley uh, shells. Carnelian beads from the Indus are found in the royal tombs of Ur. I'll show you some other pictures of those as well. Uh, Trade with the Indus starts in the early dynastic. Uh, trade with Oman starts around that time and increases, we think, during the Akkadian period and continues after that point. Right? We also have a Persian Gulf ceiling found in the Royal Cemetery. There are other uh, examples as well right, um, of, of extensive trade from the Indus. This um, is a seal. Right, two sides of it. One side has an elephant, connections to the Indus. The other side has this kind of eagle motif, which is found in Central Asia. This probably was some sort of uh, trade agreement or even some sort of passport because it had two stamps, one from different regions on either side. You probably remember this uh, sort of setup for a um, 
lady in waiting or a female servant from the royal tombs of Ur, uh, similar to some of the terracotta figures that are found in the Indus Valley, showing connections there uh, as well. And some of the carnelian beads from the royal tombs of Ur are identical to carnelian beads from the Indus Valley. Right? And you can see some of them here. These are from an Akkadian deposit. We also have a cylinder seal of a interpreter from Maluha. Right? This is like a he was like a businessman translator <clears throat> who left his home in the Indus Valley and lived in Mesopotamia. And while he lived in Mesopotamia, he would have to do um, you know, work and seal documents. And so he needed a cylinder seal. And so a Mesopotamian style cylinder seal was created for him that talks about the fact that he was from Maluha. Uh, so it'd be like a, um, you know, a businessman from Hong Kong living in San Francisco or something like that. Um, so it, it very, very interesting to see how, you know, how at this early date, how in many ways, globalization was beginning in terms of uh, trade. Okay, throughout these periods, you had different ethnic groups and different linguistic groups and different peoples moving around in and out of Mesopotamia and other uh, areas as well. Uh, around the Isin Larsa period, uh, and also a, a little bit before, you have uh, an ethnic group known as the Amorites who start migrating into Mesopotamia. Uh, Amaru in the um, in Akkadian means West. So Amorite is basically like saying Westerners. These are Western Semitic speakers who are semi-nomadic, who start to settle down in the Middle Euphrates area, the, the area that was kind of the northern section of southern Mesopotamia, not far as far north as northern Mesopotamia, but kind of the northern area of southern Mesopotamia where the city of Akkad was. And they started to settle down and kind of become part of the makeup uh, of ancient Mesopotamia. And this is actually a theme throughout uh, Mesopotamian and ancient Near East uh, history, is the relationship between farmers and nomads, uh, pastoral nomads, people who raise uh, animals. You can even see this in the Bible with Cain and Abel, right? Um, Abel is a, a herder uh, who offers, you know, a, uh, an animal as a sacrifice, and, and Cain is a farmer growing grain. Uh, so throughout Middle Eastern history, there's been um, cohabitation. Uh, there's been uh, you know peaceful coexistence between farmers and nomads, and then there's also been conflict as well. Um, nomadic groups are famous as uh, good warriors, not just in the Middle East, but also in places like Central Asia, where you have Turks, uh, Mongols, right? Uh, pastoral Nomads are usually not completely self-sufficient. They could, you know, they do live off their animals, but they also use the products of their animals to trade for things that they need, you know, like the things that they don't grow, the crops that a farmer might grow. And so they might trade wool and uh, milk and even some of the animals uh, to those areas. There's a lot of debate today among archaeologists about early nomads uh, and early herders, I should say. Some people believe that early herders in uh, ancient Mesopotamia were city dwellers who were just herding the animals around the city. Other people believe that herders were nomadic peoples moving in between cities. Uh, this actually there's quite a debate about it now as archaeologists are trying to figure out how they can actually see which of those uh, hypotheses is closer to the truth. Uh, these are uh, Bakhtaria Basari nomads in Iran uh, that typically would go to the mountains in the summer 
and then down into the valleys in the winter. So they're what's known as transhumans pastoralists. They're not uh, completely nomadic. They have kind of like uh, two different areas that they go back and forth between, and they might have foundations for their tents in those areas that they always go back to. So not all pastoralists in the Middle East are like the Arabian Bedouin. Uh, who are camel herders. There's many different kinds of pastoralism. And so there's like Turkmen in northern Iran, Tuareg in the Sahara, and of course, you know, the Bedouin in the Arabian desert. But there's also uh, Bakhtiari, Baseri nomads, nomads in, in the Kurdish areas and parts of Turkey, right, uh, who herd not camels, but sheep and goat. Um, and are not totally nomadic. They're like semi-nomadic. Okay, so these Amorites eventually uh, started to settle down and integrate themselves into uh, the population, and eventually they started to become very, very powerful and ascend to positions of power. Um, and in the northern part of Mesopotamia first, the Amorites created a ruling dynasty. Um, and we're going to look at some of these different dynasties. Um, the first really was in Assyria. Around the same time, uh, Babylon, right? This is the, the period of Hammurabi. And there was also an Amorite dynasty in the city called Mari that we're going to look at. But first, let's look at Assyria because it's one of the most influential. Now, the, the Amorites... Uh, the official language still at this point is Akkadian, and it continues to be Akkadian throughout these periods. Um, the Amorite dialect is probably very similar to Akkadian. Right? But the Amorites set up a dynasty here. Um, the, one of the main cities at this time is Asur. Um, and you can see some of the remains here. Now, the ancient Assyrians... Uh, you know, you can you'd see that uh, if they were going to trade down here with peoples through the Persian Gulf, they would have to go through intermediaries here in southern Mesopotamia. So in order to get copper and gold and silver and things like that, uh, instead what they did is to go north to deposits that existed in what's now modern-day Turkey in ancient Anatolia. And they created... And a trading system, overland trading system, uh, using donkeys, because you can connect these areas by the river, but they would traverse this area and merchants. This was actually interesting because these were independent merchant families. These were not, this trade was not controlled by the state or the temple. This was like independent entrepreneurs almost. I hate to use that word because it's a it's a you know kind of an anachronism, but just to kind of contrast what we saw before, these were kind of entrepreneurial family businesses, and what they did is they would set up colonies here in these Anatolian communities, trade with locals, and then have these goods sent back. Many of these Assyrian merchants would live for long periods of time in these colonies. Now, they called these colonies karums, which is the Assyrian word for harbor. So it was like instead of a, 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 you know, a port harbor, it was a land harbor. Um, and one of the most important sites from Turkey, ancient Anatolia, is a site called the modern name is Kultepe. The ancient site is Kanesh. And one of the reasons why it's so important is because many cuneiform tablets come from this site. And it gives us a real insight into how this trade existed and what was the life like for the merchants involved in this trade. And in fact, this is how they found the site in the first place, because people were looting tablets in the late 1800s from the site of Kultepe. People finding those tablets on the antiquities market, 
realized that something special had be fa- had fa- been found and were able to track down where the looters were getting these tablets. Luckily, then they started to excavate the site. And so we have tablets in archaeological context. Yeah, so from the tablets, we uh, can see that the trade is entrepreneurial. Um, that is, you know, it's... it's um, family run businesses trying to make a profit they're trying to produce textiles in assyria bring those textiles up to uh, anatolia trade with locals for things they needed especially things like gold and silver and then transport these things back to uh, assyria where they where the price Obviously, then they could trade that gold and silver for all sorts of other things they needed, and they would make a handsome profit. If they weren't making profits on either side, if the uh, if the Anatolians weren't getting things that they wanted, and the Assyrians weren't meeting their costs, then this trade would not have been able to survive. And you'll see that there were a lot of taxes and tariffs that these Assyrian uh, middlemen or traders had to pay But still, despite that, if they successfully returned from Anatolia, they could turn a good profit. Okay, so it was mainly, yeah, mainly gold and silver. Some copper, though, there was debate about that. The Assyrians had access to tin, uh, and you need tin for bronze. So they traded tin and they traded textiles for the other metals that they needed. Now, here's the site of Kultepe, or ancient Kanesh. Now, this is where the elites, the Anatolian elites, lived. <clears throat> and this is where the Assyrians lived. They actually lived outside of the Tell, outside the central part of the city. Uh, and the leader, he's kind of like the, the, the chief or the, the low-level king of the Anatolian community, wanted to keep a very close eye on these Assyrians and kept them basically in a neighborhood. Also wanted to restrict trade between these Assyrians and people in the community. The Essentially, the elites here wanted to monopolize the trade with these foreign uh, Assyrians. Right Here you can see this is the neighborhood that the Assyrians lived. Now, the Assyrians uh, in their houses kept archive rooms, right? All of their business documents were filed away in large storage jars in these houses, which is where archaeologists found them. So it's essentially like finding an office uh, from the ancient world. You're finding all of their records, all of their, today would be emails and invoices and receipts and things like that. In ancient times, it's letters to Assyria, just talking about what was needed, uh, how many textiles, how to make the textiles. We're going to look at some of these texts. Uh, Letters from home, things like that. The the price of things, how much tax they had to pay, leaving the Assyrian area, how much tax they had to pay on the way. So, for example... The texts tell us that each donkey carried about 30 textiles or 10 textiles and about 65 kilograms of tin and uh, a little um, less of loose tin. And leaving Asur, they would have to pay one 120th to an official. Just going into Kanesh itself, they would have to pay tax. Um, And this was a six-week journey uh, to go from one point to the other point by foot. Uh, And there were areas where, you know, they would have to essentially, um, these caravans would have to stay the night, you know, and set up camp and continue on their way and would have to worry about brigands and bandits and people trying to rob them along the way. Um, Areas where there was high security, there were, there were also fees to be paid along the way as well. Right? So the Assyrians lived in this Karum, in the separate sector. Um, they, um, 
in terms of, it was entrepreneurial only on the side of the Assyrians. The, as I said before, the local Anatolian rulers controlled the trade. There it was not entrepreneurial or independent. It was completely monopolized by the king and the royal family. If in Assyria, on the Assyrian side, though, again, it was family-run businesses. Uh, archaeologists estimate that over 50 years, 10,000 textiles were imported to Anatolia from Assyria. Okay, so money lenders finance the caravans. Uh, in order to have this business run, you'd have to take out a loan. Uh, some of the interest rates were 30%, which is, you know, a little bit nuts. Um, Assyrian male merchants would have two families. They would have they would end up marrying local women in Kanesh while they had families back in ancient Assyria. The wives were essentially running the business back in Assyria. They were the weavers and the business partners, and they were running things back in Assyria uh, while the you know the men were in Anatolia conducting the trade. Right. Um, so these were kind of family firms, as we said. Eventually, this system uh, collapsed. Um, but it was a very important part of this time period. And also, one of the most important trading systems in ancient Mesopotamia, because of all of the texts that we have that allow us to uh, really document what was going on at the time. And again, even, you know, with all of this information, uh, archaeologists can actually, you know, uh, reconstruct how much material was flowing back and forth and the different prices for things over time. So the economic records are, are excellent. And it's, you know, something that we don't have for something like the Uruk expansion or some of these other trading systems. This is local pottery from Kanesh, what the Anatolian style pottery looked like. And this is gold from an Anatolian burial in Kanesh, showing you some of the things that the Assyrians were trading for and trying to come uh, trade back bring back to Assyria. The local Anatolians who got wealthy from this trade eventually became the Hittite state and then the Hittite empire. So it's partly through trade with Mesopotamia that led to the development of the Hittites. So we know really about this through tax. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a different scenario than with the Uruk expansion, where we didn't really have many texts. Texts were just beginning to be developed. So we really know only about the Uruk expansion through archaeology. Uh, but let's look at some of the texts. Right. Okay, so here's a, an, a, an Assyrian merchant from Mesopotamia, from northern Mesopotamia, writing to his wife back in Assyria. One mean of silver, Asur Idi, right, who is the, the person who's coming back to Assyria, bringing you under my seal. The fine textile which you sent me, keep producing similar textiles and send them to me with Asur Idi, and I will send you half a mina apiece. Compared with the previous textile which you sent me, process one mina of wool extra in each piece, but keep them thin. So very, very sort of specific instructions on what to do back home. And we can see that things back home weren't always that great. So here's a letter from an Assyrian woman. A terrible famine has hit the city. You did not leave me any barley. I need to keep on buying barley for food. Where's the extravagance that you keep writing about? We have nothing to eat. I live in an empty house and the seasons are changing. So you get sort of a sense of desperation on her part. Um, and, she, you know, sort of these unmet promises uh, you know, where's the extravagance that you keep writing about? Uh, you can sort of imagine that he said, don't worry, honey, we'll, we'll make a killing on all this, you know. Um, and she's starving and she's writing and basically, you know, remember, it takes six weeks for the letter to get there. Uh, you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, things are not going great back here. 
Um, so we have letters like that. And then we have those the basic letters that we saw before. Letter from an Assyrian woman. Be sure you send me the value of my textiles in silver so I can buy at least 10 measures of barley. Okay, so uh, you get a good sense of the trading system that existed here, which made you know the Assyrians wealthy, made the local Anatolians wealthy. Um, this is going to be very different from the new Assyrian period, as we'll see. This was a period mainly of peaceful overland trade, at least between these areas. Okay, around the same time, Amorites were also building dynasties in southern Mesopotamia, especially in Babylon. And this is why it's called the Old Babylonian uh, Period. Uh, again, they were speaking Akkadian. The official language of government is Akkadian, although Sumerian is still being written. It might be one of the first writings, uh, styles of writing that a student would learn. It would be like, um, you know, learning Latin today. Um, and, uh, you know, especially during Victorian times, you wouldn't just learn Latin. You, you would learn Latin pretty well. Um, you know, you would be able to recite uh, Cato and, and, and Virgil and, and writers like that. Um, so, you know, Sumerian was, was con and the, the texts of Sumerian were considered to be very important. Um, but let's look at another Amorite dynasty before we get to Babylon, and that is Mari. You can see Mari right here uh, was an important city in the early dynastic period that then became very powerful during this Amorite time period, this old Babylonian period. We have an Amorite dynasty in Mari, where this dynasty builds one of the most impressive palaces ever built in the ancient Middle East. 